There's one from Anon saying, physicists that who could code used to be the hot commodity. Is it helpful now? Seems like CS uh, machine learning people, computer science and machine learning people are more in demand than physicists. Why is that? You know, I think it's a complicated story because back 40 years ago, for example, sort of the people who went into physics were sort of the best and the brightest, so to speak. That was the top field. That was the field that was kind of had brought the world, you know, the Manhattan Project, the, you know, particle physics, all these kinds of things. The At the time, like 40 years ago, even 30 years ago, computer science was this strange kind of area in a sense that was sort of a sort of an offshoot of math, sort of an offshoot of electrical engineering. In some places, it was kind of connected to a business school. It was a, a funny thing. And, and what was taught there was sometimes very theoretical, sometimes very kind of uh, in the weeds practical. And it wasn't a field which was getting, you know, it had plenty of bright people, but it wasn't sort of a, a typical destination of the best and the brightest, whereas physics was. And so at the time, sort of if you were the the uh, people who were just generally kind of analytical, quantitative, kind of problem solving, they were often led into physics. And that physics for a long time, oh, at least so probably 70 years or more, had has been kind of a very successful export field. People get trained in physics and then they go off and they revolutionize or invent molecular biology, or they invent lots of things in quantitative finance, or they invent lots of other kinds of things, I don't know, in the space program and so on. It was a, a field where it was getting in the best and the brightest, that sort of training in physics tended to be kind of, yes, oriented towards computational things and computational in the sense of uh, uh, you can actually work out an answer. It's not just talking about things, so to speak. But yet, unlike things like pure mathematics, which in a sense were very kind of oriented towards form rather than function, you know, let's make sure the proof works exactly right and has exactly the right form. In physics, it was more like, let's just get to an answer by all means necessary, so to speak. And that was good training for many other fields. And that led to kind of a um, uh, uh, physics being a very successful export field. Now, in terms of physicists who can program, that was a later thing. When I started in physics in the mid-1970s, I was very unusual in knowing how to use a computer and becoming sophisticated about that and building large computer systems and so on. That was, yes, there were experimental physicists who were doing that, but among theoretical physicists who were the main, I would say, the main supply chain for kind of export to other fields was theoretical physicists. Um, uh, experimental physicists had a different kind of supply chain going into much more uh, kind of uh, uh, areas that were much more kind of um, building actual electronics and so on uh, kinds of things in the, in, the, uh, in the world at large. But in the theoretical physics domain, the number of physicists who could program was extremely small. I mean, ridiculously small in some ways. And it was sort of one of my uh, personal meta innovations was just realizing computers are useful. You should learn about how to use them uh, and use them as tools. And then I started building those tools by, by 1979. I was, was starting to build my own kind of computational tools. And that's what's turned into mathematical morphing language and, and all the things that we, we have today. But uh, so being a physicist who could sort of solve problems, get an answer by all means necessary. And one of those means being the, the kind of huge leverage and tooling of writing, of being able to use a computer. Yes, that was, that's been a very powerful combination. I would like to think that our technology stack over the last 38 years or something has become, has been sort of the, a mainstay of physicists who can code what what they use to actually figure stuff out in the world. And I think the kind of the use of our computational language together with the general 
methodology of physics, get to an answer by all means necessary, so to speak, is really powerful. Now, what's happened in computer science and machine learning and so on? Well, what happened is in the, in the probably in the 1990s, 2000s maybe, computer science in universities began to expand rapidly and the domain of things that you could study and that made sense to study in computer science broadened. I'm afraid that in many universities, there's this kind of complicated sort of interplay between, well, I'm studying computer science. Why are you doing that? Well, because I want to learn how to program. Well, learning how to program is more of a trade, a craft, than computer science as a science is sort of about kind of the bigger picture, the theory, the 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 architecture of things. And so it, it's sort of a, a funny situation because there is sort of the the trade of writing code and there is kind of the the idea of sort of thinking about things computationally. Computer science as an academic discipline is an awkward place with respect to that because a lot of the time it's like, well, I'm going to do a degree in computer science. Well, that's really just because I want to learn to program, which is not a traditional kind of uh, at least elite university type activity. That's and, and, and for a long time, many of the elite universities resisted having computer science departments because they thought of it as a trade like that, as something like learning, you know, plumbing or carpentry or something of that kind, and a different type of thing than the academic aspirations that they had. So, but so somehow, sort of the trade of programming became called computer science in many universities, and it's a lot of what people do, but there's this question of sort of how do you think about things computationally, not computer science, but sort of computational X for all X. You know, how do you get to CX rather than CS, so to speak? Computer science departments mostly haven't been doing that. And that's still a thing that doesn't really have a great place in academia. It's sort of a funny situation because mathematics, for example, has pure mathematics that is sort of math for its own sake. And then mathematics is a, as a tool used in a lot of other fields and how that works at universities and so on is complicated. I mean, there was sort of an effort to have an applied math that would be sort of math that was going to be used in other fields, but that isn't usually, doesn't usually work very well as a centralized thing. There's kind of math as a, you know, then, then, then the question is, do you teach the math as part of the physics of a of, of sort of a physics department? You have sort of a service course of math taught by the people who would otherwise be doing pure math, math for its own sake. How does that work? Or do you have a separate applied math that's kind of dealing with the math that can be applicable? It's a little bit complicated. And, and that has played out that sort of, I would say, still playing out in the computer science area. And I would say that the, the thing that I happen to believe is that CX, computational X, and the things that lead to that, that's the really valuable thing that people should be learning. The details of how to write code, how to uh, set up you know, some Java environment, or how to do some particular thing, you know, that what gets taught has changed. You know, nobody teaches us, well, very few people teach assembly language anymore. It's kind of moved to teaching you know, C++ and Java and Python and so on. These are all pretty low level things. And you know, I think the the important thing, the thing that's sort of the surviving thing that the AIs don't get to do for us and so on, is how to think about things computationally, how to formulate what you're thinking about in computational terms. That is not yet really what computer science departments have emerged into doing. And I think it's it's just not clear where that's going to land at universities, whether it's it's going to be a thing that computer science successfully gets or not. But you know what's happened in computer science in universities, I think, is that there is this trade of programming part of things. There's also theoretical computer science, which is a fine area, much closer to mathematics. And then there are various applications of sort of computational methods, various computational Xs, like robotics, like cryptography, uh, like essentially machine learning, which in some ways is a kind of application of computational thinking, computational X. But machine learning is a little odd because it requires a much higher level of math in at least many levels of, of working on it 
than has been traditional in computer science. I mean, many computer science departments were dropping requirements for students to learn calculus, for example, because in, in writing, you know, in doing software engineering, who needs calculus? But in machine learning, at least done at a sort of semi-theoretical level, you need, you need calculus. And so that's been a sort of an awkward thing. And actually there's been a certain flow from physics into machine learning um, but then there's also been kind of a, oh, the computer science department now has to teach calculus again. This is a messy story. I mean, this is not, a, I think, a clean story. Now, what's happened is some of the kind of physics thinking has gone into areas like machine learning, partly because it had an importation of physicists, partly because its methodology is quite physics oriented, many of the people who were originators of that field were originally physicists exported to that field and so on. And I, I think the, uh, um, now machine learning is, is, is a weird case because the theory of machine learning is, is, well, it's not clear how much theory anybody knows. I mean, I've worked on this trying to understand sort of at a, at a foundational theoretical level, what's happening in machine learning. But there are toy versions of machine learning that are absolutely amenable to theory, you know, whether it's support vector machines or whether it's sort of some very basic approximation to neural networks. But by the time you get to the real used in industrial settings kind of machine learning systems, they're not really amenable to kind of, oh, yes, I learned calculus so I can understand what's going on types of methods. And so it's, it's sort of the idea that, oh, well, we're going to have machine learning courses and they're going to teach things at the level where you need to know calculus is a little bit of a fiction because that level is a level below the level of what's directly relevant to actually doing machine learning. Because what's actually relevant to doing machine learning is at this point still a lot of kind of engineering, uh, kind of folk information, experience, those kinds of things. It's much more a kind of slightly more judgment intensive version of software engineering. And I say slightly more judgment intensive because it's like you have to kind of understand the psychology of the AI. What's it going to do if I train it in this way? What's it going to do if I prompt it in this way? So it's a, it's a weird thing that I don't think is really, it's not really landed at a theoretical level. But it's also the case that the people who've gone into machine learning early on are some, sort of some of the best and brightest of, of these times. And that means that the people who are sort of, oh, yes, I'm trained in machine learning are, you know, just by the selection effect, are going to be people who are really capable of doing all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, the same is to some extent true of computer science in general, that it's been an area that's attracted a lot of very talented people. And so that's a good hunting ground for, for sort of export to other areas. Whether the skills that are learnt in detail are relevant to what you do next is not so clear. Just like in physics, learning you know the details of uh, Maxwell's equations for electrodynamics is not so relevant if you're going to go on and do molecular biology or quantitative finance. But the kind of the discipline of of trying to understand how to think about things in those terms probably is useful. But exactly what the what level of abstraction and what level of definiteness is useful is not so clear. And in computer science, the, well, I know how to program fluently, that's clearly useful. Um, it's, I know how to think about things computationally, very useful, but not very well taught. The, the kind of, um, I'm just going to get the, the thing to work, which is a lot of what one is doing if one's doing practical machine learning. It's not necessarily what academic machine learning is like. Um, that I'm just going to get the thing to work, that's also a very useful skill. It's more on the engineering side in something like machine learning than on the physics and analysis side. Um, and uh, so, you know, slightly, this is a complicated area.